Hello and welcome to the Flower Light Mystery School. And again, I'm joined by Christine. Hello. And Charlotte. Hello. So today I just want to talk about um, a character, a fairly controversial character um, to do with ancient Egypt and also to do with um, the connection between Ireland and Egypt. And um, that is Akhenaten. But um, first I just want to give a bit of a background really on um, Akhenaten and... Um, his ancestors, I suppose you'd say, and this, their story. Um, so, um, one of the stories that's told uh, each uh, in previous podcasts, I've talked about how each temple is almost like a chapter in a book, and and not necessarily each temple, but each sacred site, if you like, pyramid included as well. Um, and so, when you put them all together, when you have understood everything that's um, contained within that temple, sacred site, pyramid, whatever, mound, um, and you put them all together, they make up a book, and the book is the book coming forth by light. So, um, the part of the story that's told in Edfu Temple is um, called Zeptepi. And Zeptepi means the first time. So, what they were referring to was the first time when the gods were on the earth. That's um, basically the way it's understood. And so it talks about how um, these beings called, they, they're known by different names, but they're called the seven sages or the builder gods. Um, and it tells how they were led out of their own homeland, which had been devastated by a flood. And um, they were led out of that homeland by Toth and led into Egypt where they created, um, recreated rather, what they had had in their own homeland. So, as I mentioned, they were known by different names. They were known by um, the Sebeti or the Shebetu, but... Um, that's also to do with the followers of Horus or the Shemshu Hor. But there's other areas where they're talking about as uh, the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. So um, just to say about that, um, we spoke in the last podcast about how um, in the king lists, they talk about uh, the divine beings. Um, it's the lists of uh, Manetho, a Greek scholar that compiled... Uh, the lists of the divine beings and then this was in ancient Egypt and then after the divine beings the gods in other words mm -hmm. or the neater that were in ancient Egypt after right. them came the Shemshu Hor right that's the one I've heard before the Shemshu Hor as yeah well. and they were the semi-divine beings and then after them they say came the mortal kings so um, in the last podcast, I think it was the last one that we spoke about how that's actually describing the fall of consciousness. Right. So from gods to semi-divine to mortal. So. And mortal being asleep, like consciously, you know. Like. Yeah, yeah. So uh, also it's describing, um, for example, you know, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age. Yeah. So it's it's Neolithic. describing the descent into the, the Dark Age, if you like. Yeah. Um, and... Also, obviously, alchemy and the mystery schools is describing the path back out of yeah. that dark age yeah. and into fully enlightened consciousness. And when those that were fully enlightened, fully awake and operating to their complete potential were known as gods or the neater. Right. And mm -hmm. um, because they could do amazing things. Yeah. You know, so the story is told on Edfu Temple walls of. The homeland of the primeval ones and the primeval ones were the seven sages, sages, sorry, are the builder gods. And it tells how they, as I mentioned, were coming into Egypt to recreate what they had had in their previous homeland. And so um, it tells of how Zeptepi basically is talking about, as I said, it means the first time, but it's also talking about it also describing how Zeptepi is a very advanced concept in a way. And what it's describing is 
a, a vortex point or a portal. Okay. Or a zero point where matter mm. and antimatter meet. Right. Sort of like if you look, at, say, there's the pyramid and then there's the etheric pyramid on top where the points touch. Exactly. Is yeah. that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that means that a human being would have a correlating place as well. Right. Because you have a torus around your body. There's going to yeah. be a place where that happens on you as well. Exactly. And it's, um, you know, if you think of the point at the exact center, yeah. as you mentioned, um, yeah. that's fully awake consciousness, I feel like. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's balanced, an interesting. Hmm? Balanced consciousness, consciousness. Yeah. Fully awake and fully balanced. Exactly. Yeah. yeah the balance. That's very important. You have the male, female. That's a good point. Yeah. Surely. Yeah. Um, and so Zep Tepi is talking about. OK, it, it's talking about the time when these seven sages came in to recreate what they had had in their previous homeland. Mm -hmm. And the previous homeland that we talk about is Atlantis. Yeah. Um, that's an, that's one of the names for it, right? That's one of the names. Yeah. And um, so, of course, Zeptepi is a time, they say, when the gods, you know, which, as I mentioned, that's awakened consciousness was were right. on the earth. And it's a time when um, manifestation takes place or the creation of realities so what that's saying really is that zeptepi is a time when manifestation is instantaneous oh. so it's saying that zeptepi was the time when we were fully awake living and being to our full potential and therefore we were creating realities right that was the point in time where we were creating realities cool. so <laughs> yeah, it is pretty cool. But it's also, Zeptepi is also a place of awakening. Yeah. But it's also the place of forgetfulness. Um, oh, so tell us so about that it's paradox. The paradox again. Exactly, <laughs> it's the paradox again. Which is something we've been talking about this morning. So mm -hmm. it's, so if you think, imagine if you draw a circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said to you, point to me the place on that circle that is the beginning and the end. And the line, like, yeah. You can't. No. Yeah. Because it's an inter it's the circle is one thing. Yeah. So, what an let's say what a mystery school initiate or a fully awakened consciousness would understand yeah. is that every point on the circle is the beginning and the end all at the same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's Zeptepi. That that's Zeptepi. So, that's so it's like, continuous. So Zeptepi, they're the the gods, are they again? Just Zeptepi so is. Okay, let's put it, let's say it this way. The waking people. Like yeah, let's say Zeptepi is more referring to a level of consciousness. Ah, okay, that makes sense then. So, so, so the Zeptepi, like, teachings would be like, yeah. like being awake. Exactly. Yeah. So when they talk about, in ancient Egypt, and they talk about the time when the Neaters walked the earth, yeah. and the Neater, if you remember, I mentioned in a pro previous podcast, were the gods so, and goddesses. Sorry, I should say is that as well. Mm -hmm. Um... But the gods and goddesses referred to by the ancient Egyptians mm -hmm. are us. That's right. In our fully awakened state. That makes sense. Yeah. They were the ancient Egyptians in their fully awakened state. Mm -hmm. The gods and goddesses is humanity in its fully awakened state. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. The Shem Shuhor is humanity so saying, in its half awakened state. So is that like also kind of saying that there is no like hierarchy? I think we talked in like the previous podcast. Like mm -hmm. the previous podcast mm -hmm. like that. Um, that there is no people like higher yeah. or like kind of or less than others. It's all yeah. that you're all the same thing. The hierarchy consciousness is lower is, consciousness. It, yeah. It's lower consciousness, yeah. and it's directly a three D consciousness, if you like. Yeah. In the three D, we always have to think of something um, as being either this or that. Yeah. You know, hard or soft, light or dark. Like yeah. you don't consider the, the in between crazy. point, <laughs> yeah. and the in between point is the zeptepi. That's it. When you bring those two points together. So, um, so you asked me something else there. It was about, um, what was it? Oh, I was, sorry, you, you asked me yeah, a question I there. Is that it? Gone at him. No, I confused it. It went out Or just like that, like, just like that saying that, to clarify. <coughs> oh, yeah, people, sorry. Yeah. And kind of like that, I guess like that mindset or like that. Yeah. That so, way of like conscious being. Yeah, sorry, I just forgot what you said there. Um, yeah. The Yeah, so Zeptepi would be another way of saying when humans were fully awake. Yeah. fully enlightened fully yeah. um like we're already enlightened we just need to remember yeah so you it's, know 
So like, it's not like they're like beings. They're not like, different people to us. They're, they're just like, yeah. The neater, the gods, yeah. the goddesses, they are us. That makes sense, yeah. And all we need to do is remember we are them. Wow. And that's the cycle. That's it. The cycle of remembering and forgetting is the same as the cycle of light and dark. Remember when we talked in the Samhain <laughs> podcast? That's it. I love it. And we were talking about the light and the dark. Yeah. Um, so the light and the dark is would signify, in this instance, the awakening and the forgetting. And that's the cycle that consciousness, us as, as human consciousness, or as immortal consciousness, we fall into the thinking that we're human. And that's the cycle we go through. We go through from immortal, awakened consciousness, yeah. when we know we are the manifestors. That's it. We are the creator of the thoughts and the realities. That's it. And that's us in Zep Tepe. That's it. When we knew that we were the creators. That's it. Yeah. Um, and so as consciousness fell, you could say that as our consciousness began to fall more deeply embedded into the ego it. and into the idea of the material 3D world, yeah. we became semi-divine. As being all that there is. Yeah, we became semi-divine. So our semi-divine state would have been um, symbolized by the Shemshu Hor. Mm-hmm. And they were also known as the followers of Horus. Yeah. And then when we fell completely, we became the mortal. The humans. Yeah. yeah. And that was in our completely asleep and would that State. be would that be like last podcast we were talking about um was it mount sinai the um temple up there where they found the white part of gold yeah, what, that wasn't the mount sinai sorry what was it sarabit al kadim sarabit al kadim that's mm-hmm. it but we were talking of the white powder that they found there that's right yeah and so to me the white powder monatomic gold would have been part of the kind of half asleepness in other words they couldn't do yeah, what that's they why could they do were, yeah they couldn't do it without help, exactly. whereas before their consciousness was so high, exactly, exactly. they could do it naturally. Yeah, that's exactly. Being awake means that you have your 360 senses, not just six, like they tell you you have. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Because, in, so, oh, I, sorry, I'll, I'm distracting you, but that's No, you're not. I, I was going to say that um, I actually make the point about the, what you're talking about, the white gold. Yeah. I, I'll make oh, that good. point well, as, I'm, as just, I'm talking about it. It just meant me, I was thinking about how when consciousness fell and it became semi-divine, they knew what they could have done in the past, but how to do it with yeah. what the tools you have now. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah. and the the thing is as well, they were aware enough to know that they were losing their awareness. Yeah, exactly. That's it. They were, and that's why they left things. Like the great we left things. So we like left like things for ourselves, for ourselves to wake up. We exactly. left things for ourselves yeah. to wake up. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So we knew our consciousness was falling. Well. So we left major signs and signals for ourselves when we were completely asleep that at least a glimmer of us would look at it and go wow what's that you know I mean people who are completely asleep and I'm no offence to anybody because I've been there myself (laughs) um, will look at the Great Pyramid and I'm only taking that as an example and you have a sense of awe and wonder there's something that it does to you physically mentally emotionally whether you're whether you know anything about anything that what I'm talking about or not it will strike you in a way you'll come away Mysteries. Yeah, you, you'll be you'll be slightly, you know, it'll have an effect on you. Yes, put it, it that yeah. way. Yeah, it <clears throat> you won't be kind of nondescript towards it. Yeah. I don't know many people who are. Um. So yeah, again, as I said, I'm just giving you a background to Akhenaten because that is the kind of main theme of the yeah, podcast. Yeah. So, but you were why am I saying about like, Septepi yeah. and yeah. sorry, Christine? No, why am it. I saying about Septepi and yeah. um, the seven sages and mm you know, coming from their homeland that had been devastated. So um, the reason we're talking about that is because th- these people, if you like, and if you, you know, if you want to put it that way, like um, as we fell more into physical form and co- because, as, uh, sorry, let me say as well, when we are fully awakened in the time of Zeptepi, for example, we're not physical the way we are now. Right. Okay. You see, it also goes hand in hand that when you are fully awakened, you are not physical. Well, you can be like omnipotent. Right? You can be if you you can be physical if you, if you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't. Well, really you can lower an, your consciousness. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you, believe me, when you're not physical, you don't rush back to being physical again. You don't. You're not yeah, going yeah. to want to be. But if you wanted to be, you could be. So as you as you as the consciousness fell. And they became semi-divine, so we'll say the Shemshu Hor. And the Shemshu Hor um, are those who carried out the instructions of Zep, of those in Zeptepi. So I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so the Shemshu Hor were semi-divine, if yeah. you like. 
Um, the fall in consciousness. Yeah, the fall in consciousness. So as consciousness falls, so too you become more physical. So the Shemshu Hor wouldn't have been pure energy. They would not have been pure energy. The Neater would have been. The gods yeah, would have been. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the semi-divine, no. They would be more, not totally physical, but not completely pure energy either. Yeah. Like if you could just imagine like maybe, a t I'm only giving you an example, but maybe like a hazy type of figure. Yeah, you know. Could it be, and then, just to distract for one sec, could it be like what people described as the two of Dedanon, the shining ones? Yes. Yeah. In ancient Ireland, like yeah, the exactly. shining ones. Yeah. Yes. So the two of Dedanon would be the counterpart to the yeah. Shemshu Horror in there Ireland. There you go, yeah. that's what I thought. Good point, Christine. So, and then when we com become completely separated from our knowledge that all is one and that we are immortal, when we become separated from that knowledge, mm -hmm. we fall into what is the ego. And it's the ego that makes us think that we are separate from each yes. other. It's the ego that gives you the thinking that you're separate from everything yeah. else. Yeah. Without well, like the you, ego, without the ego in the way, you, you would know, know that you're, we're all one. So, we're all one consciousness. So um, what I'm saying is uh, there was probably more, but I'm talking about two waves, two waves mm -hmm. of... Um, people that w left Ireland and went into Egypt. Mm -hmm. So one would have been the first wave, which would have been the first fall of Atlantis. Okay. First, um, first fall of Atlantis. So it's not like the Zeptepi. It, this is what I'm talking about, yeah. Oh, okay. So that would have been, say, the first time, yeah. which what the Zeptepi means. Yeah. So that would have been the first time the gods came and laid down the plans. So what they're saying is that the, the gods in Zeptepi um, were creating realities oh. for the rest of the semi-divine and the mortal okay. that would experience as they oh. fell further into consciousness. Oh, okay. You see? Kind of like was, leaving the pyramid. They know when you're fully asleep in 3D, you just see a big thing. Do you know what? It's like if you were in a cave, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And you were going into the cave and you knew... There's loads of little different alleyways and corridors off this and everything else. You're never going to find your way back out. Yeah. So what are you going to do? You're going to bring a string with you. Yeah. Tie one end outside and bring the rest in. So that when you're in the deepest, darkest part of the cave you and you want to come back, back out towards yeah. the light, you, follow the string. you follow the string. That's what they were doing. Okay. So the neater at the time of Zeptepi were um, creating that string okay. to follow on down through the descent of consciousness till it went into total physical sense. form and completely asleep. Yeah. yeah. So that was their plan. Cool. So the first fall of Atlantis, they left what I'm, I'm saying is Ireland. Okay. okay. And they went into Egypt. Now they went all over the world, but I'm just talking about that part. When they went to Egypt. Us. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, and remember, we mentioned it was the Irish that kept the knowledge alive. That's right. In, bo in both Druids, yeah. instances of the fall of yeah. Atlantis. And the fall of Atlantis really is about the fall of the knowledge and the fall of consciousness. So um, this is an important thing that's written. Um, all of it is important, of course. But mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the seven sages and the builder gods. So why were they called builder gods? Like that sounds a bit, you know. Because, Specific. <laughs> yeah, builder gods, like, you know. Um, because, so I suppose manifestation could be referred to as building. Yeah, of course. Because you are, you're building. You you're know, creating something. You're, yeah. A reality. Mm -hmm. And they were also known as the mound builders. Now, the interesting thing is that underneath every temple and pyramid in, in Egypt, there's a mound. Mm -hmm. All the temples, pyramids, including the Great Pyramid, are built on mounds that are underneath. So... The plan that was laid down during the time of Zeptepi mm -hmm. by the gods was carried out, put into place, and physically constructed mm -hmm. by the Shemshu Hor. Yeah. Okay? So we're saying fully enlightened consciousness laid down the plan. Yeah. But fallen consciousness, half fallen, midway, the semi divine, the Shemshu Hor. Put it into, put it into place. Yes. Yeah. So 
Now remember, so they, they were created physically it physically created. because they couldn't they do it the same way the other it. gods could. They physically created it, the Shemshu Hor. Why? Because it was there. Remember when you're in the dark cave, you need the, the, the rope or the string mm -hmm. to find your way back out. So this plan was the string for when they f completely fell into physical form and went completely asleep. So in the mid phase, in the mid phase when they yeah. were semi-divine, they carried out the plan that was laid down during Zeptepi. Yeah. Okay. And they, they um, created this entire complex. Now, the plan during Zeptepi was, don't forget Zeptepi was the time for manifestation and creation of realities. And the, and the plan was yeah. to find, do you remember in, the, in one of the podcasts I was saying that in the story of Plato, the, the Plato story that when he talks about Atlantis ends where it says the gods met at the center of the earth. Right. To yeah. discuss the falling consciousness of the Atlanteans. Yeah. Well, the center of the earth, or should I more accurately say, the center of the earth's landmass. Yeah is the Great Pyramid at Giza. It marks the exact spot of the centre of the, the Earth's landmass. Earth, yeah. yeah. um, so the plan that was laid down at Zeptepi was to create, physically create these structures on the ground and start at the centre of the Earth's landmass. So what they were doing was they, they were to create these sacred structures on top of these mounds that were laid down during Zeptepi. And the very first one was at the centre of the earth, where the Great Pyramid is now. So that mound was laid down. And from that mound, all the way down the Nile, there was mounds laid down, created, if you want to say, mm -hmm. all the way down the Nile, upon which would be placed in later times by the Shemshu Hor, temples and pyramids. Oh, OK. And they would create those temples and pyramids using the exact same pattern or plan or schematic that they had used when they created the mounds in the first place. Okay, so, so if you can imagine Egypt and they, now this actually extends out over the whole world, but we're just talking about Egypt for a minute. Mm -hmm. They found the center of the earth, which happens to be in Egypt at Giza, where the Great Pyramid is. The Great Pyramid marks the exact center of the earth. And from that exact center of the earth, what they were doing was creating a network of ancient sites that spanned up and down the whole of Egypt, but of course all around the earth. And each one of those ancient sites are linked directly back in to the Great Pyramid, which is at the centre of the earth. There you go. So the first part of the plan, if you want to say, that was laid down during Zeptepi <coughs> was the creation of the mounds. Mm -hmm. So the first one was placed at the centre of the earth and then all the rest were geometrically placed at geometric distances yeah. from the centre, from the one in the centre mm -hmm. and placed all the way down along the Nile yeah. and of course all over the world. Mm -hmm. And then after they placed the Shemshu Hor, then placed temples, mounds, sorry, temples, other sacred sites, pyramids on top of where those mounds were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the Edfu building texts also say the law of temple building and a temple, a pyramid is also a temple. A sacred place is a temple. A mound could be called a temple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A stone circle could be called a temple. So when I say temple, I really mean any sacred structure, including a pyramid can be a yeah, temple. Yeah, on a ley line, like the morphogenic fields of so, earth. Exactly. So um, the Edfu building texts also say um, the law of uh, temple building says that no temple can be created unless it's on top of one of these original mounds. Mm. Okay. Now, why? Because yeah. in Zeptepi, the original creators were the Neeter, the gods, the ones who were awake, the ones who created this plan in the first place. Mm -hmm. So what did they know? Well, they obviously had highly advanced <laughs> knowledge information. and information. Mm. So... They were creating a highly advanced, complex system mm -hmm. of structures that spanned the entire earth. Now, I mentioned in the other one, a few of the other podcasts that all these structures are made with stone, which have highly high uh, quartz content. Yeah. And the great electromagnetic field energy. Yeah. 
well yeah that's that's the type of energy that's it's these sites harness natural earth energy mm. um, and not just natural earth energy natural universal cosmic energy yeah cosmic energy yeah. which is far more potent and yes. in infinite supply than our explosion combustion that we yeah use you yeah. know um, our technology is polluting it pollutes the atmosphere oh yeah yeah you're right. this is non-polluting it works in harmony with with the earth, with the universe, with the cosmos, and the more you use, the more it's produced, and the more that so, produces, right. the more it, that flows. Re- renewal. It's like it's yeah. so not it, like our uh, electricity. It's very. It low, actually low. helps the more you use, rather than the up. Op- uh, we pollute the more we use. That's you it. know. So the more you draw on this energy, the more it creates it, and the more it's powerful, and the more it's you know, because everything is in harmony, and that's what this plan was. So, during Zeptepi those that came into Egypt to cre- to recreate this plan they had in their homeland was to create because it had been devastated mm-hmm. by the movement of the tectonic plates when um, yeah. the earth all moved and the land masses broke apart yeah. and the people moved from Ireland, England and those areas over to Egypt. Why? To find... Why did they go to Egypt? Because that's where the centre of the earth was. Right. Oh, so when And in the past, the Ireland the earth, was the centre of the earth then. I mean, the centre of the earth when it was all like one land mass. That's what happened, you see. The land masses broke apart and moved around. So, so at the time, because consciousness of, was falling, even of the earth itself, correct? Even of the earth itself. Mm. So at the time, and in actual fact, the catastrophes that happened contributed to the fall of consciousness. That's it. It was all part of it, you know. It all yeah. Worked together to yeah. So um, during the time when problem. Ireland would have been at the center of Atlantis, yeah. the land mass of the earth would have looked very different. The continents and the, and yeah, how the map right looked right. would have looked different. Yeah. But when um, Atlantis fell. In other words, when a catastrophe happened, you know, there's a lot of people, re, you know, thinking on what that could have been that made that happen. Yeah. But yes. that's not the focus of what I'm talking about. It happened and... It doesn't matter how land, it happened. It, yeah, it the con- happened. continents broke apart, land masses moved. And so what happened was the earth went out of balance, yep. which it still is, by the way. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> so the people had to find in order to keep their balance, because don't forget everything about the mystery schools and alchemy is about balance. That's why the sacred geometry is so important, mm-hmm. because that's the only that's the only way to keep you centered all the time. So, um, they were looking to find the new center of the earth so they could keep everything in balance, even though the earth itself was actually off balance. Yeah. Um, but so they found the center of the earth, which was in Egypt. That's why they went to Egypt. Yeah. Because that's where the new land mass of the center of the earth was. Yeah. Okay. And they started a whole new grid system. Because remember, they already had one, and it was destroyed by right. the movement of the plates the and whatever devastation. Whatever the cataclysm was, yeah. So when they went into Egypt, they were creating a whole new, and it was a worldwide system, not just. Yeah. So they recreated it, and all the temples that you see now in Egypt, yeah. and all over the world. Now, I can't say all of them are part of the, the newer system, because some of them are part of actually the original old one yeah. that I still exist. Mm-hmm. Mm. But what about, um, it's quite interesting because recently Bosnia came up for us on the other day. Because I'm kind of saying there was two falls of Atlantis, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So and you'll understand a bit more as I go down. Yeah. Because, because the first wave of people, sorry Christine. No, I agree. The first wave of people that came in yeah. was in the time of Zeptepi. Right. And then there was a second wave. Okay, so the second, the second wave, when was that? A second, well, no, not of Zeptepi. Second wave of but consciousness But a, sec- a second wave of people that came okay. from... Um, Ireland into Egypt, if you like. Oh, okay. So that's what you're talking about when you say that. Yeah, a second wave of people that came from Ireland into Egypt. Because in the first wave, even though I'm talking about consciousness, I'm also talking about a movement of people. Right. And and a movement of how, where the centre, where the focus of their um, learning would have been, okay. if you like. Okay. And that would have been at the centre of the earth to keep the balance of the earth. Because everything they were doing was about keeping the balance of the earth. That was all to do with the mystery schools. Was about keeping the balance yeah. of the body, mm-hmm. keeping the because once everything is in balance, yeah. then consciousness is fully awake. It's yes. because we're out of balance, and more in our male energy, that and the, the earth is off balance. Everything is off balance, yeah. and that's why we fell into um, mortal consciousness, yeah. if you like, and and fell asleep. But also, uh, something just for me is that what's happening is we're here right now, at this place in time, because. After December 12, 2012, that was the end of a cycle. Mm-hmm. We've, been in, we've been on a new cycle, the cycle of the Age of Aquarius, which is speaking, referencing to the hor- horoscope, you know, and the plan, you know, that part of the constellation Aquarius, right? So we're no longer in the Age of Pisces, we're in the Age of Aquarius. 
And that's about the consciousness rising, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rising back up again to where it would have been when it was able to be divine and build things by thinking about them as opposed to actually having to get a copper tool. But that is how they created them. Yes. We're at the bottom now, so all we can do is... No, we're not at the bottom. We're at the beginning of a new cycle. That's what I mean. We're going up on the roller coaster. We're coming out of the bottom. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. We're like on the roller coaster. You know, we went down. That's what I mean. Like, we're going back up again. Yeah. Yes. That's what I mean. Excuse me. That's why... Yeah. You could only go up from here, right? Yes, exactly. Well, that's why we're talking about this now, because people need to know, like... Sorry, we all have colds as yeah, well. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Sorry, but guys. it's not, no, it's not a cold, it's a clearing. It's a clearing. The clearing. lower energy is getting out of your physical body. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a good point. I don't know who said that, but um, at the time of Zep Tepi, um, the structures, if you want to call them that, would have been manifest from pure thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, when we were fully awakened, gods and goddesses, if you like, yeah. when we were and that near. was at the time called Zep Tepi, yeah. we were... We manifest using our thoughts yeah. because th- th- we still do. It's just we don't real we don't yeah. remember that we do. Not. We don't think we do. We're now. not balanced. That's yeah, true. that so sounds. Yeah, that. I mean, that's that's what we do. That's how we create. But now, if you say that to somebody, they think it's a strange thing and will laugh and won't believe it at all. Oh, well, they think you might but, be a Doctor Mesmer and a magician. But, but actually, that's what the most ancient science. Um, maybe science is the wrong word to use. That's what no, the most science, science is, is a modern right, word. It, it's, it's sacred science. It, it's a sacred science, and that's what the most ancient. And, and greatest minds that we have do. have left Force. that information It's like, us. if you think Einstein about it. Einstein did it, right? Yeah. He was a modern and scientist. Yeah, he was a modern mystery scientist. school initiate, yeah. yeah. And so Nikola Tesla. And Nikola Tesla. Yeah, yeah. And, all, and lots of them, yeah. And Leonardo da Vinci. That's it. And Rembrandt. Because I spent to... my years investigating the secret language in paintings and art. Yeah. Because, well, of course, now that I know, it's all encoded, mm. right, Antoinette? Mm. For the person, like... As they said in the ancient mystery schools, it's for the people who have, with for eyes to see and ears to hear. It means everybody who's asleep is looking at it, but it's not making any effect. But if you are awake, mm-hmm. yeah. you get the signal. Yes. It comes through. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that's said about, you know, ancient Egypt is that its, mm-hmm. its civilization was a legacy that was handed down from an even older civilization. Most Egyptologists and archaeologists agree that um, the civilization of Egypt did not develop in Egypt, okay, yeah. that their knowledge was a legacy that was given to them by somebody else because they sprung into existence too quick. Yeah, yeah. They were able to build perfect pyramids within three to five hundred years of their origin. That's that's unheard of. At that one place, yeah. The Great Pyramid was supposed to be the first pyramid they built, and then it all went downhill from there. Yeah, yeah. So well, Saqqara, I think they say was the first uh, pyramid that they built, but um, within three to five hundred years of their origin, they had built the Great Pyramid. And everything they tried to build after that just went downhill. Oh, yeah. I've seen the mud bricks. So it's it's it runs contrary to what you would th- any yeah. yeah that in a civilization that's only beginning that they're at their height of their technological <laughs> advancement in the beginning and then as they get as the civilization gets older and more mature it gets degraded instead of seeing them advancing they from that point down. Yeah, what you actually see in Egypt is that the, it's going down. So go. yet again, so that's it's one a of paradox. The the, that's it's one of another the paradox. Like how did the Egyptian civilization start? fully advanced there's no evidence of how they evolved all this yeah. knowledge and so it's a common um, conception well it's a it, it's a common uh belief i suppose between archaeologists and egyptologists that um start. that it was a legacy that their knowledge and their science the egyptian knowledge and science was a legacy brought into egypt by another civilization mm. or by another people whatever you want to say yeah and that was Atlantis. The other people that brought it into Egypt was Atlantis. And the story is told in Edfu as the story of Zeptepi. Yes. So the ancient Egyptian people themselves wrote down how this knowledge, how um, consciousness and how um, those with the knowledge yeah. brought it into Egypt, if you like. Now, don't forget, I know it can get quite confusing because <laughs> at the one... It, at the highest and finest point, it's all one. We're not talking about people from Ireland or Egypt or South America. Or when we're looking at Zeptepi, we were all one. Yeah. One consciousness. It didn't separate. What Akhenaten Wait, brought no. back in in the mystery schools was a thing called the law of one. Yes, the law of one. Yes. Anyway, I'm I'm gonna move on. Oh, I'll, I'll talk Wait, about. I'll just that say in a for Charlotte really fast. No, because Me- I, do, do you mind just? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. If you don't, sorry, I don't mean to talk. No, I just no, want to no, finish no. this point because. Keep going. Um, what I was doing, just giving you that, 
Yes. What, what I was doing, just giving you that section there about mm-hmm. Septepi and the Shemshu Hor and the Edfu building texts and what we've just discussed there for the past few minutes is kind of a background. Of what? Of Akhnaten? Of Akhnaten, yeah. yeah. So um, I just wanted to give you that background. Um, so and uh, the context. The context. Yes, and it, also yeah. in the, the Book of Coming Forth by Light, if you remember, which is also known as the Book of the Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just telling you this, uh, you know, as it kind of ties in with um, the Irish connection, if you like. Mm-hmm. So um, there was a pla- there was a thing called Seket Aru, and it was known as uh, the Realm of the Dead, um, or the place where, you know, all the ancestors, the dead ancestors mm-hmm. went. But that, in the in the ancient Egyptian mind, was in an island in the distant west. Ah, okay. Now, do you remember we were talking about yeah. in the Samhain podcast how all the souls were called back to Chuck Don? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, from an Egyptian... In the west. In the west, yeah. From an Egyptian perspective, Ireland from is the, the furthest west. land in the west. Yeah. yeah. From an Egyptian point of view, we would be the yeah. furthest land in the west. Um. And it was also known, Seket Aru means, Seket Aru, um, it's spelled S-E-K-H-E-T and then a hyphen and A-A-R-U. Mm-hmm. So it's Seket Aru. And it means, it, it also, it means field of reeds. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing about the reed was, the reed was used by the scribes. That's yeah. right. As a, for, as a pen, a writing oh, wow. implement. And so, um, because they said that the field of reeds was Seket Arrow, which was in the distant land to the west, mm-hmm. and because the reeds signified writing, it meant that the distant land to the west was the home of the scribes, of the wisdom keepers, uh-huh. and the, the reeds were their symbol. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's why it was known here. as... The, exactly. <laughs> and so... Ireland you mean is the known, land of saints and scholars? Exactly. <laughs> Ireland is known as the Emerald Island, the land of saints and so- scholars, and we're known yeah. all over the world in, in ancient and modern times as the land of saints and scholars. Why? Because we preserved this knowledge, not just once, but twice. And when I say twice, what I'm saying is the first time was what we were talking about in Zeptepi. Yeah. And then when all those structures were created all over the world, the knowledge came mm-hmm. from the people of Atlantis, Ireland. So you were putting the seeds there. Exactly. And then the second time that we preserved the knowledge was when the Crusades, the religious Crusades. Yeah. Because this knowledge is the seed of all religion. So the religious Crusades that took place, and I'm not talking about any one religion in particular, but the religious Crusades that took place all over the world to convert people yeah. to certain religions. Yeah. By force. <laughs> that was the yeah. second time. The second time that... Okay. The Irish, aka the Atlantean tribes, okay. preserved the knowledge, and they did so. For example, with um, the original people who wouldn't have been called monks, no matter who, what anybody wants to tell you, the original people weren't monks. They were mystery school initiates who would have been out on islands like um, the Skellig- Blasket Island, Skellig- yeah. Michael, yeah. yes, Iona, yeah, preserving and recording Avalon. all this ancient information. Yeah. Again, don't forget they were part of the Shemshu Hor the semi-divine yeah, mm-hmm. so they were and they were creating the thread that was going to keep going down all the way yeah. to the mortals okay. they were part of that as, to keep this information alive so. and they created it in the form of and I mentioned this before and it's not the only one I'm just saying it because it's probably the most well known the Book of Kells yeah. and you can see in the Book of Kells there's a lot of writing in it Yes. but if you look around the writing it's all geometry mm-hmm. and it's embedded in the geometry is the higher dimensional information. So, you'll get certain information from reading the writing. Well, it's like the but balance, from right? translating the geometry, you'll get way more. Yeah, so, it's the which higher is why dimensional. to this day people come directly from airports to buses to go straight in to look at the Book of Kells at Trinity College. Yeah, so, yeah, it's well, still doing its. Most job. people don't understand what they're looking at, but it, the geometry course, you see, yeah. according to the law of correspondence, as we mentioned, as above, so below. Once you have the pattern, the blueprint. Yeah. Then you can create it on the smallest scale you want yeah. or the largest scale you mm-hmm. want. And so what these people during Zeptepi yeah. knew and had was the divine blueprint. Mm-hmm. In other words, how energy became matter. That's right. They knew how that happened. 
physical manifestations. Like exactly. That. They had the blueprint, the plan, for example. If you were an architect and you were building a house, mm-hmm. you wouldn't just go out and start throwing bricks up. <laughs> Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, yeah. you'd, you'd have plans. Yeah. yeah. You'd have a purpose. You'd have your plans on the table, yeah. you know, and you'd follow your plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had the plans, plans, you know. And when I say the plans, worldwide, what they created during Zeptepi, the plan that was laid down, mm-hmm. that was then put into physical manifestation by the Shem Shuhor or the semi-divine, was all based on sacred geometry. So if you were to look at the sites all around the world, the ancient sites that were created, yeah. that the Shem Shuhor cre- created, and placed on top of all these mounds. Mm-hmm. So why did they say, Jordan Zeptepi, why did the Neeter say, okay, all the temples and ancient sites have to be placed on one of these mounds? Because those mounds marked out the, the pattern yeah. all over Earth. And that was a geometric pattern, a sacred geometric pattern. Mm-hmm. That That was the literal instructions on how consciousness or energy becomes matter because it all happens through geometry and number mm. so this would be like the light body of the earth the the flower of light the morphogenic fields around earth is that what you're saying the in terms of where the sites the on earth points, the are like the modem or the medium mm-hmm. that the interface the interface okay. the sites on earth are an interface mm-hmm. they're an interface between the physical mm-hmm. and the multi-dimensional the, the ethereal or the multi-omni-dimensional yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. They're like the vortex points, right? Yeah, yeah, they're the interface between the two. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Do you know what I mean? They're the... the like where you stand on like the a bri- like a, the balance. Like, like a bridge, bridge, like a bridge. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, the like middle point. If, you, if you're interacting within these ancient sites, mm-hmm. then you're actually taking part in both the physical 3D world, but you're also in taking the part in the omnidimensional That's it. part of your nature. Because you're inside a structure. That's created using the sacred divine you're blueprint. In the and you're standing on a part of the earth that has been located as being a point in this sacred divine blueprint. Yes. So it's like right that's like, like gateways. The physical yeah. place, yeah. Gateways, portals. So the entirety of the earth's sites. Yeah. Ancient sites. All put together. The plan that was laid down by the gods and goddesses in Zeptepi. Mm-hmm. If you could visually see the plan that they created when all the mounds were placed all over the earth. If you could visually see that and connect all those dots or mounds, yeah. okay? Do you know what pattern you'd create? I can kind of guess. What? The flower of life. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You create the flower of life. Yes. Yeah. So you can understand what they were doing. Mm. They, by creating this divine st- um, structure on earth and by literally physically placing this divine pattern on earth, by creating temples to make that shape on earth. They were balancing, at the very least, what they were doing was balancing the tectonic plates of the earth. Mm -hmm. They were balancing the earth itself and therefore all consciousness on the earth was being balanced. Now you can move on and talk about advanced technology, how they were using earth energy, how they were using universal and cosmic energy. And if you want to think about how advanced this knowledge that they had, look at Nikola Tesla. Look at what Nikola Tesla was doing with the radiant energy of the sun. Mm-hmm. And not just the energy of the sun, but the energy of the moon, the energy of the stars. Each, the energy of the sun, the sun that's in our solar system, has a certain energy. Lunar energy is different. Celestial energy is different. But each star's energy is different. So all the energies from different parts, like people talk about solar energy. and But these ancient people were so highly advanced that they could use... Lunar energy, celestial energy, all type of energy. I mean, our sun is a star. Yeah. People talk about sun worship. Yeah. And there's one person in particular talking about uh, the ancient connection with Ireland, and that's a guy called Michael Tessarian. And he talks about how Akhenaten was a sun worshipper mm-hmm. and how Akhenaten um, created all the sun worshipping religions mm-hmm. and how Akhenaten destroyed the Druids of Ireland mm-hmm. because the Druids of Ireland were astronomers. They observed the stars. Mm-hmm. And what Akhenaten did, no, this is what he says now, and what Akhenaten did was he came in and slowly, by his influence and by creating his religions, this is what he says now, I'm only oh, telling okay. you what Michael Desarian says. I don't <laughs> agree with him. He says, 
Akhenaten came in and destroyed the Druids' knowledge by infiltrating and by enforcing sun worship. See, because a lot of people talk about Akhenaten being a sun worshiper, but that's because they don't understand. And so that's what Michael Desarian says. But the point is, he says the ancient Druids in Ireland were celestial the observers of the stars, yes. blah, 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 blah. And then Akhenaten came in as this big bad sun worshiper and made them all suddenly worship the sun. But just the kind of slight little point in there is that the sun is a star. Yes. yes. You know, and these people back in the time that he's calling the Druids yeah. would have been knowledgeable enough, even though he's not. Yeah. Michael yeah. Cesarian yeah. is obviously not knowledgeable enough yeah. to think before he says it like that. Our sun is a star. So why would you make the difference between a sun worshiper and and people who observe the stars? Yeah, there's no, there is no difference. Like, cor- and that was like, of, uh, like, of that was like corrupting them. Like, that's what he was. That's what he says. Yeah. It wasn't a star, well, it was, maybe that's what he. Yeah, but know, but. I mean, that's a good point. But that is what that's what Michael Desarian says. Now, don't get me wrong. Yeah. He has very good research in his books, but how he his whole theory on Akhenaten runs completely contrary to what I know. Mm-hmm. So I just brought it up anyway to say to make that point yeah. um so um what we're talking about is bringing a divine blueprint yeah. so really what you're saying is the blueprint that we're talking about that they created all over the earth that if you make visible looks like the flower of life yeah that is literally what you're looking at there although it might on the face of it seem a bit difficult to understand how yeah. what you're looking at there is the mind of the creator Mm-hmm. that's what you're looking at yeah when those patterns yeah yeah the sacred geometry and each phase of the sacred geometry so from your um seed of life your egg of life your flower of life your tree of life your fu- fruit of life metatron's mm-hmm. cube mm-hmm. and all the other geometries that are extracted in between you know what you're looking at is literally the thoughts of the creator that they are the thoughts of it's the true. creator because the creator thinks in geometry and numbers. Mm. Highly awakened, advanced consciousness does not think in words and letters. I and know, that's lower dimensional, yeah. It thinks in shape, shape. geometry, numbers. Mm-hmm. That's the science of the creation of the universe. Wow. And um, there's a quote that says, if you want to speak to God... You've got to understand the language of God. I think it's Plato that says that, mm-hmm. or maybe Pythagoras. If you want to speak to God, you've got to understand the language of God, and the language of God is numbers, shape, and form. So, it's not always e- it's not that easy to understand on the face of it. But yes. don't forget, this was called the Great Work, and that's why people took lifetimes to do it. Yeah, is it? Because Alchemists, um, right? Yeah. So that brings me to Achnaten. So, what I'm saying is. Now, as the consciousness fell from at the point at Zeptepi, where the gods and goddesses would have been fully awake, as the consciousness fell to what they called the Shemshu Hor, or in Ireland, the Two Haredan, mm-hmm. and this was the consciousness of humanity. I'm not just talking about people in Ireland and Egypt. Right. It was the consciousness Across of the everybody on earth. This was happening to the consciousness of everybody on earth. So the consciousness was falling, as per the cycles. And it will rise again and it will fall again and it yeah. will rise again and it will fall again. It's a cycle. Natural cycles of Earth, you mm. know. Um, and that's why if you remain always balanced, then you've always got, you're always, it's, it's almost like having one foot in each place all the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're never in, in either one or the other, you you're know. Everywhere. Yeah, you're never. Everywhere, nowhere. <laughs> well, no, what, you, what you're saying is like you're, you're as long as you're balanced, you have access to both things. Yeah. Whereas you fall in consciousness, then you're only stuck in one side, you know, like yeah. there's no bridge, like Antonin's saying. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, a lot of people, archaeologists, Egyptologists, agree that um, the knowledge that was in ancient Egypt that allowed them to build the sacred structures that they built, because one of the mysteries of ancient Egypt is how do they build those sacred structures, mm-hmm. you know? Because the structures in Egypt are um, the mathematical equations and formulas and ratios that are built in to the temples. Um, they should not have known that. Mm. Right. Like the formula for pi is double pi is built into the Great Pyramid. But according to conventional history, it was the Greeks who discovered that. 
Yeah, exactly. But ancient Egypt comes long before the Greek civilization. Yeah. So, like, they should not have known that according to our conventional um, history, but yet they did. Do you know what I mean? And and if I remember correctly, you know, uh, Sophocles, Plato, all these people, they went to Egyptian mystery schools oh, yeah. and then went back to Greece. All, all so, the greatest minds had to yeah. study in the mystery schools. Yeah, before they became who they were in their own countries. Not just necessarily in Egypt, but the ones yeah. that you mentioned yeah. did. Yes. But all the greatest minds studied in the in, were initiates of the mystery schools. Yeah. Even in modern times, all the greatest minds, Nikola Tesla. That's right, yeah. I, they're all mystery, mystery school initiates. They call adepts. Um, so and and so was Akhenaten, which yes. you know brings me to Akhenaten. Well, he's um, very interesting how he became involved in everything, his whole childhood and yeah. everything. Yeah. So um, Akhenaten's. So that's what I wanted to say actually. Sorry, just before I say that, a lot of people will say about you know Irish people, and even people who wouldn't be kind of um, as immersed in this mm-hmm, information as we are, as we are um, would turn around and say, "Well, Newgrange is older than the pyramids." Irish people will always say that, you know. Yes. It's like it's it's in their DNA. Their DNA. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. if you mention anything to an Irish person, your average Irish person, if you start talking to them oh, about yeah. the Great Newgrange. Pyramid, at some Newgrange. point they'll turn around and say, "Well, Newgrange is older than the pyramids." It's like yeah. they'll always correct you. They'll That's never it. let you say, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. What so came it's, first? Yeah. So it's like in our genetic memory. And and also we're going to correct you if you say it wrong, yeah, by the way. Yeah. That Newgrange is older, you know. But as it turns out, it, it's right. And I'm not just talking about, you know, like structurally, I'm talking about where the knowledge came from, if you like. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. The first fall of Atlantis, all those people came from Ireland. And and don't forget, Newgrange is a mound. All the places that yeah, we have, you know. So they're the mound build, They're the mound builders, you know. But so you see the mounds all over the world, of course, because as I said, they went everywhere. So like Newgrange, would that have been like um, something from Zeptefi time? Yeah, Newgrange is like Noah's Ark. So like, yes, exactly. So yeah, so that would... Newgrange was like the mound from like Septepi. Yeah. And it didn't have any like physical structure from the shows you were built on top of it. No, it wouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Um, and yeah, exactly. And Newgrange would have been like, you know, would have been the biblical Noah's Ark where life was saved during a catastrophe, you yeah. know. All the where, information was put in there. Yeah, but you know the way they say in Noah's Ark, the animals went on two, two by two. Two by two, as in DNA. Well, we're talking about genetic information here. It's yeah. far easier yeah. to store. <laughs> genetic information than it is the actual fully grown animal you know what it I mean is, yeah. Yeah. you can, can just store some DNA it's a gene bank you can store a lot more information and then trying to jam all the animals that's, in. that's it yeah <laughs> so Akhenaten would have been the ancestor of the people that came into ancient Egypt mm-hmm. so now remember I said there was two waves the first wave was Jordan Septepi there was a second wave where the Atlantean tribes came into Egypt again in around the 18th dynasty. The and wonderful 18th dynasty where everything interesting happened. Yes. And um, a huge part, there was other, well, there was other, re- but I mean, the biggest part of the reason why they were, why they came into Egypt, the Atlantean tribes, was because, and this is a big thing, the Amun priesthood, um, who were gaining incredible power and wealth and everything else, and I spoke about them before, um, were becoming totally corrupt in, to such a degree and to such a level that they were actually destroying the people mm-hmm. and the country. And the knowledge could never stay alive with that amount of corruption. And yeah, so they were called in basically to Egypt and they met with Tutmos III. Now, Tutmos III is Akhenaten's great-great-grandfather. So, those Atlantean tribes came into Egypt, and in particular into Luxor, and ancient Thebes, and met with Tutmos III. Now, the interesting thing about Tutmos III, who, um, there's a a papyrus called the Tuli Papyrus, Mm -hmm. and it talks about how um, Tutmos III had an alien encounter. Ooh, tell us that. Yeah, so it talks about where he uh, saw, and his, not just him, but all the people in his court, if you like, 
um, on one one day like saw all these wheels of fire they were calling them that were in the sky and Ooh, oh, wheels that, of fire oh you mean sta- wheels of fire just like at um Clacta on Halloween where she yeah. came with exactly. her very uh, good very good connection yeah. uh, Simon Magnus and her father Rugmuth or whatever his name was sorry I'm American what was it? and he brought her there and they had Mugrus, traveled yeah, and they came from the um, from the east right which would be from supposedly yeah. Jerusalem yeah right with the good old stone which is Egypt, but I mean close, very close to Egypt yes hey. well actually what well, we're is, talking about is, was Egypt is, at that yeah, time right Egypt. so but so um yeah, so in a that's, flying wheel of fire. Yeah, so that's 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 kind of an interesting point as well. Mm-hmm. But to me, you know, like when we're saying that about the you know the wheel of fire, and probably a lot of people would say, you know, oh aliens, you know what I mean. But what I'm saying is, you know, the wheels of fire and those that were in the wheels of fire that most people would refer to as aliens. I'm again saying that it's was you. us. It's us. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree It's as us well. in our highly advanced In your higher form. Form. So, I mean, haven't you ever seen... Time a, travelers. Actually, Antoinette, there's a... Time travelers. There's a good People science. from Zeptepi who were fully awakened... Yes. ...could time travel to the time of the 18th dynasty and appear in the sky as what, what t- most three thought were aliens. But they're communicating with themselves. Because the people who are... But it's actually Tutmos three looking at himself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> as a time traveler. Yeah. Having come from... That's it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, so it's himself a, as a time. Mind, yeah. His mind higher consciousness is mind, mind his higher stuff. consciousness is communicating to his lower sleep self yeah. as it's descending. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like so trying to keep him awake. Wake up! I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. We've left all these, you know, signs and symbols and things yeah. for well, ourselves to wake ourselves up. That's exactly it. So it's like a big. Um, so it's us talking to ourselves because ultimately, ultimately, creation is. Consciousness, God, whatever name you want to source. put on it, source, looking at itself, yes, from a myriad of different angles, yes, that makes up the illusion of the multiplicity, yeah. And the hologram is the mirror, the aspect. unity, yeah. the unity observing itself from a multiplicity of different angles makes up the illusion, the illusion mm-hmm. of separateness, yeah, and the reality that we think we live in. Do you know what, did you get what Wait, I said no, there? Say that again one more time. Yeah. So, the unity, the one consciousness, okay. known as God or the creator consciousness, yeah. reality or the illusion of what we see as, you know, the 3D reality. you're separate to me, I'm separate to you, yeah. I'm separate to Christine, okay. we're all separate, you know, individuals. individuals. We're all individuals. We all have minds of our own. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever see that from the life of Brian? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so what the law of one, if you like, and the science that Akhenaten re-established in ancient Egypt and um, brought back and what they knew at the time of Zeptepi is that creation, reality, physical manifest matter and the separateness of humanity that they think they're separate comes from unity, the one consciousness observing its self from a myriad means an infinite amount number of different angles. So oh. I'm looking at myself from this angle, but I'm also looking at myself from this angle, but yeah. I'm also looking at myself from yeah. from all, because I look different from every angle I look at myself from. Yes. So I can believe that it's something totally different when in actual fact, it's just it's me. me looking at me. There you go. It's consciousness looking at itself in the mirror does, does of its own. Like different people like? You you looking at me and me looking at yeah. you, we're looking in a mirror. Wow! It's consciousness looking at itself. Yeah. But the consciousness is is all unity consciousness basically. Because we have come down to this mortal, mortal three D three third dimension. Yep. That dimensions mean scope of movement. Yeah. You the more you move up dimensions, yep. degrees of freedom. Mm. So. In the third dimension, what you're basically saying is you have three axes of movement Mm -hmm. that you can make. Up, down, front, back, side to side. So if you think of the lower dimensions, they have less axes of movement. 2D, 1D. 2D, 1D, 0D, no movement at all. There you go. So as you move up the dimensions from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3D where we are, Mm -hmm. 
what increases is the freedom of movement that you have. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because in 2D, say you draw a 2D circle on the page, it's a flat. Mm -hmm. It's flat. Yeah. Circle on the page. Bring it into 3D, now it has volume. Yeah. Go into 4D, what's 4D? People say the fourth dimension is time. Yeah. It's Metatron's QB. So each time you quantum leap up to a new dimension yeah, it's or a higher dimension, you have more freedom of movement. That's it. So finally, it's total freedom. You're not confined in, in a body. Yeah. You're not confined thinking that you're in this box. Thing, yeah. And the box that people refer to as thinking outside the box, the box is Metatron's cube. Mm -hmm. And that's what we deconstruct when we're doing. That's the geometry. The geometry. Above it. Everything because above it is... Metatron's cube a stage in the flower of life? Yeah. Or is it... Yeah. Is it it's... before the flower of life? No, it's after. It's the okay. last stage almost. The last okay. stage. Um, no, it is the last stage. Um... But the interesting thing about the pattern that was created all over the earth to make th this flower life, remember we mentioned yes. during Zeps Happy? Well, the, um, the knowledge that they contain is also known as the canon of proportions. Yeah. And the canon of proportions is what all artists use. Which is going to say, that's Leonardo. Yeah, to make anatomically accurate figures. Whether they're sculpting them or whether they're painting them. Like the Fibonacci sequence? Yes. Or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the golden ratio, you know, the golden yes. number. So the golden number is a mathematical formula by which every human being grows. Uh -huh. It's like the program. Yep, yep. Do you know what I mean? That's it. Um, and fingers. once the button is pressed, in other words, conception takes place, okay, yep. that program will run. Yep. And... It will go Just step by step by step. Do you know Slip, what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's like computer-assisted design, you know what I mean? The CAD, where you put in what design it wants and it'll just build it up. Do, 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 it? Do, 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 because it has Program. the proportions. Yeah. It knows what goes where. The ratio. It's the so ratio. the canon of proportions in the human being dictates that everything remains balanced. So it means that if, you're, if you are growing according to the canon of proportions, which we all do... <laughs> um, then it means that everything in your body is growing in harmony and proportion. Yeah, it's about harmonics. So in other words, your head doesn't grow too big for your body. Or your right arm doesn't decide to be five times bigger than your left arm. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything grows in harmony and proportion. And in nature, it acts like this. What if a plant decided to sprout all its leaves on one side? It would fall over and die. So the Fibonacci sequence in nature yeah. is like the golden mean sequence in human, human beings. beings the Fibonacci sequence in nature dictates that when a plant sprouts leaves that are flowers it does so in a geometric proportion so that it it maintains balance and harmony mm -hmm. so that it doesn't sprout leaves all on one side and fall over and, and crack yeah you know so this ancient knowledge is not only reflected in these ancient structures all over earth yeah but it's actually written in, in you you are the living embodiment of the flower of life yeah. and the template of all this geometry yep. so it's not that like you have to learn it you are it you are it you've just got to activate it and remember yeah. it and how you do that is by walking into one of these ancient structures that was created during Zeptepi by us when we were fully awake for us when we were fully asleep to yeah. be able to go in and remember hey hold on a minute there's something strangely familiar about this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like w walking through in as we do the, when we walk into the temples. In people the te have deja vu's all the yeah, time. Yeah, uh, into the uh, they remember other lives. They yeah. remember yes. themselves from different timelines That's because it's all happening. Right now. It, it right literally now. is the catalyst to to like turn on stuff. If you're anywhere yeah. there, your yeah. your the sacred geometry in your auric field. You walk in, ching. Like, and even though what I do now is the mm -hmm. quantum healing hypnosis when I yeah. work with people one on one. That's actually part of this ancient science, mm. even though it's been taken, you know, singled out as a, as a therapy, if you like, yeah. uh, not therapy. Um, it, well, it's quantum healing hypnosis. It is therapy, actually. Quantum healing hypnosis therapy. Yeah. Um, and so. Yeah, that's what she called it. Yeah. So. Um, and that's about remembering past lives, yes. other lives, lives that you're living right now. Well, like you were saying. And once we do that. In the quant yeah. Right. Once we do that in the quantum healing, we're starting to piece all the information together and remembering that we are immortal. Yeah. 
And so there's different ways, you know, different ways to do it. But so Akhenaten would have been yeah. a descendant of the original Atlantean tribes that came in okay. to ancient Egypt. But I said they came in a second time during um, the time of Tutmos III. And they met with Tutmos III and because of the meeting that Tutmos III, who is, if you remember, Akhenaten's great-great-grandfather. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and why did they meet with him? Because he's the lineage. He's their lineage, yes. if you know what I mean. Yes. Now, lineages and all that start to come in when, when we're human. Yeah. I was just a lineage say, makes no very, sense. That's when we're very not. 3D. No, it is 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Linear. We're in the 3D world here. Uh, so I'm talking about fully fallen consciousness, even yes. Akhenaten himself. Yeah. He's more, he was mortal. He was, yeah. you know, um, he was a fallen consciousness like we, we all are still, you know. Um, so when we talk about lineage, we're talking in 3D time because there wouldn't have been in the time of Zeptepi. We're all one, don't forget. Yeah. So we're we all of the same lineage, do you know what I mean? Can I just say, like, when he was a young man, he was in Heliopolis, right? He was... Yeah. Trained in the mystery school, initiated mm-hmm, things mm-hmm, in Heliopolis, mm-hmm. the city of sun yeah. in Egypt by Giza. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he didn't think he was going to be Pharaoh, right? When well, he was a young man, because his brother—that's an interesting thing. His brother um, Tutmos was supposed to be Pharaoh. Yeah. But his brother died um, under or disappeared under because his body was never found under mysterious circumstances. Oh dear. So they never um, established what happened. They never established what happened. But he disappeared when he was quite young. And a lot of people think that, um, in actual fact, the character that we think of as Tutankhamun, mm-hmm. being the son of Akhenaten, mm-hmm. is in actual fact um, Tutmos, the brother of Akhenaten. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So that wouldn't be something you'd hear, like... From conventional of, although, No, no, not really, but... So even Akhenaten himself, for example, um, Sigmund Freud uh, wrote a book where... He suggested that Mose, um, Akhenaten was um, either Moses himself or was one of an important, you know, right hand man of Moses. So a lot of um, characters that would have been written about in the Bible would have been found particularly in the 18th dynasty. Yes. So um, there's, um, I mean, for example, Akhenaten was the person who said, I am, and we spoke about this in the last, in one of the last podcasts, um, I am the son of God on earth. Yeah. And he was, he meant the S-U-N, the son, um, meaning he was the light of God on earth. Right. Um, or the light of the creative consciousness on earth, if you like. Um, and so he was also the one who wrote what became in the Bible, the prayer, our father who art in heaven. And that was originally written by Akhenaten. Mm. And it's called A Hymn to the Atom. Yeah. So um, a lot of the biblical characters, as I mentioned, can be found in particularly in the 18th dynasty. So the father, the parents, should I say, of Akhenaten was Amenhotep III. Yes. And Tai was his mother. And the parents of Tai were... Two quite famous people. Um, again, they would have been connected with biblical characters. So the parents of Tai were um, Yoya and Toya. And they're buried in the Valley of the Kings. And um, Yoya, another name for Yoya was Yoya Sef. Mm, and Yoya Sef is where the name Joseph comes from. Yeah. So the Yoya that is the mother or the grandfather of Akhenaten and the father of Akhenaten's mother. Oh, his mother, okay. So, Yoya and Toya are the parents of Tai, Queen Tai. Right. Who is the mother of Akhenaten. Right. And Yoya is the biblical Joseph, you know, Joseph with the Technicolor Dreamcoat. That I knew, yeah. And don't forget Joseph of the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Um... Well, first of all, the Technicolor dream coat is a Druid cloak. That's right. And the Technicolor meant that each each Druid, and Druid is a word, of course, that would have been used. I'm not saying that they would have called them that in that time. But um, the Druid cloak had different colours depending on whether you were a poet, whether you were um, a, a judge, whether you were, you know, it depended on 
whether you're a musician, whether you're um, a therapeutic, a physician. Oh, yeah. So you wore different colors. Yeah. But a person who was skilled in all of those things wore the multicolored cloak. So, so it's kind of the high, the high druid, the olum. The, the arc druid, the olum. Yeah. yeah. So olum is an Irish word and it means, as you said, the arc druid or the high, the high, the one, the elder of the tribe. The elder, yeah. Um, and so don't forget Joseph as well. In the Bible, we're told that Joseph had the skill of interpreting dreams. That's right, yeah. And that's how he became... Advisor to the Pharaoh. D- advisor to the Pharaoh, yeah. yeah. So that's just um, an interesting connection with that because the whole thing of the, um, you know, multicolored cloak mm-hmm. and that he was in a, a, had the ability to interpret dreams because a huge part of the mystery schools... And the temples themselves were used for dreaming. Mm. So people would literally go to the temples and don't forget the temples were built according to this divine blueprint. Yep. Um, and remember I said the divine blueprint is literally the mind of God, the mm. mind of source creative energy. Right. So people would go in to one of those spaces. Into the Holy of Holies. And sleep. Mm-hmm. So what we're saying is they would go into the mind of God <laughs> yeah. and sleep. Astral and dream. Traveling. Yeah, mm-hmm. and dream what they called well they wouldn't have called it dreaming but that's the word we put on it yeah and um they would interpret you know there would be people in the temple um the person themselves the student or initiate whatever you want to call them themselves would interpret their own um experiences but they'd also have people there mm. you know that would the teachers in- interpret um people's dreams as well if they if they needed them to so dream interpretation was a huge part of the mystery schools, you know, we call them dreams, but I mean, what are dreams really, you know? But anyway, so, so if we can imagine that, you know, during the time of Zeptepi, consciousness was fully awake, aware, we were the gods, we were the nature, we were, we knew we were immortal. And then, as is told by the fall of consciousness, um, symbolically told, as in the Shem Shu Hor, mm-hmm. um, the consciousness fell. And then again, even further into fully mortal form. So it's at that time that Tutmosis III mm-hmm. restarts the mystery schools in Luxor. And in particular in Karnak Temple. In Karnak Temple, okay. In Karnak Temple. Would that have been among the priests Karnak of Ramon Ra as well? Would the priest of Ramon Ra have been there? Well, this is where it started, you see. The Atlantean tribes had got the call because... The knowledge was being corrupted and degraded in the land of Egypt. And it was, this was happening because the information, it had been infiltrated. Mm -hmm. And so people had infiltrated the mystery schools. And the Amun priesthood would have been part of the mystery schools. Um, All the priesthoods originally would have been part of the mystery schools. Mm -hmm. But as consciousness fell and as time moved by, um, it became corrupt. Yeah, in it other became, words, all of the mystery priests, schools became infiltrated and corrupt. Yeah, in other words, so the priests that would have been working to attain the unity consciousness again to speak to the higher multi dimensions, okay, well, they became egocentric. Yeah. So then they were working for whatever the priesthood wanted. Well, their consciousness fell as well. That's what I'm saying. So. Yeah. Yeah, they became very corrupt and they started to become power hungry and the ego came in and um, they Slavery what they did was they that. developed a way of keeping the sacred information for themselves mm. and giving a lesser version, a corrupted, distorted, lower version of the sacred information is what they gave to the people in the form of religion. So... Um, it was the Amon priesthood who created, for example, the structure of governments, the structure of um, religions, the structure of the whole tax system, yeah. all that type of thing. But what... Oh, yeah, if you couldn't pay your taxes, they took your children, so yeah. slavery as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and they were... And, and the story, in fact, of, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a story that's told in the Bible about how Jesus went into the temple mm-hmm. and through the tax collectors out of the temple. That's right. <coughs> well, that actually happened in Luxor, in Karnak Temple. In Karnak Temple. And it was Akhenaten that went in and confronted the Amun priesthood because they were literally 
if people hadn't got the money to pay in the form of money or the form of land or the form of whatever that Food was for birth like or at the time, the priests were taking their children. So, um, and the Amun priesthood at this point had literally become so corrupt that even the pharaoh, who should have been right. like the king, if you like, hmm. um, the priesthood was actually had more power them, yeah. and more land and more control yeah. than the pharaoh. The pharaoh was at the beck and call of the That's right. priesthood. It was completely swapped upside down. <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty much the way it is today. Um, it's exactly, and it's still the same. It's yeah. So. Um, so the Atlantean tribes were, were called into Egypt because of that, because the information was being infiltrated and corrupted. And one of the, one of the huge ways that it was done was the infiltrators dressed exactly like those who were the preservers of the knowledge. Oh, so there's that mirror imagery, right? They dressed exactly like them. They talked like them. They acted like them. They pretended to be them. So the people were fooled. The people thought that the people couldn't tell the difference between those that were the pure shining ones, if you like, yeah. the ones that were preserving the wisdom and the ones that have had infiltrated the wisdom. So they would be the manipulators. Because the infiltrators yeah. had done it so well. Yeah. They literally dressed like the, like to look like them. Yeah. They taught, they did everything. And just so gradually, like the, step by step. The black magicians that yes. use the symbols backwards. Yes. yes. Right? Yeah. They invert everything. The opposite. And gradually, step by step. They used the sacred information to take control of the people. And the status quo has remained the same till this very day. He tried. Akhenaten tried. Well, so Tutmos III haven't met with the Atlantean tribes because of the nature of how the information was being corrupted in ancient Egypt. Um, And the answer they came up with was to restart the mystery schools. Not to to, to restart because they were already there, but they had... dimmed to such a small flicker that so it was really to kind of make more people aware if you like yeah so that um goal or that um concept began with Tutmos three and the meeting with the Atlantean tribes and that trickles down then to Akhenaten and Akhenaten himself um can you just remind me Tutmos's just for the people listening Tutmos's three was Akhenaten's great great grandfather there you go so four greats (laughs) So, um, he, Akhenaten, you know, on having had that information handed down to him from Tutmos III, um, and his mother being part of the Atlantean, that's an important point, and I don't yeah. know if that came across in what I was saying. I, that's what I'm saying, remind, the, we're going into the lineage now. So. Yeah, but Yoya and Toya. Yep, Yoya and Toya. Who were the parents of Tai, and Queen Tai was Akhenaten's mother. Amenhotep III and Queen Tai were Akhenaten's parents. Mm-hmm. Okay. Akhenaten's grandparents on his mother's side were Yoya and Toya. And Yoya was the biblical Joseph, as I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And Toya, or Tai, she's sometimes called, or Taya, Some she's also Taya. called, mm. um, was the daughter of Yoya and Toya. And Yoya and Toya were part of the Atlantean tribes. Mm. Now, now, this is where the kind of problem, in a way, started with Akhenaten, although there was a number of them. But one of them was because Amenhotep III, now, he has Amon in front of his name, so he right. was part of the Amun priesthood. Yeah, exactly. So Amenhotep III was the father of Akhenaten and was Egyptian, if you like. Yeah. Akhenaten was part Egyptian on his father's side, part, but part Atlantean. Atlantean tribe on his mother's side, mm-hmm. and, and his grandparents. On that lineage, they were Atlantean Irish. So that's yeah. really interesting because that means that for many thousands of years or hundreds of years, there was no direct Atlantean blood. So it was like the, the yeah the lineage the had two. been broken. That was the yeah, important so thing. Yeah, so he represented like returning blood wise to the yeah yeah yeah, and that's okay. why the Amun priest didn't want him. Yeah, of course. Well, he shut them down. Right? Well, so. he did, and he went into the temples and he shut down the Amun priesthood. He shut down the temples. He tried to tell the people that the Amun priesthood were corrupt and that they were um, using the knowledge against them and that um, they weren't trying to help them or enlighten them or anything else. He tried to tell the people, you don't need a middleman to communicate with source energy, with God. You don't need a middleman. You have a direct connection. Um, But it would be like today if somebody was trying to discredit a religion 
you know. And say somebody went into a particular religious establishment and said, oh, all your beliefs are wrong. Yeah. And tried to convince the people that all their beliefs were wrong. Well, they'd be thrown out, wouldn't they? They'd be attacked yeah. probably yes. yeah. by the people and told to get out and blah, blah, blah. And that's what happened to Akhenaten. So um, a lot of the people um, didn't listen to him and in actual fact attacked him. Yeah. Joined with the M1 priesthood and attacked him because... They were so brainwashed. Well, they were brainwashed. And because what he was doing was he was shutting down everything they knew. So, in order to understand this kind of concept that Akhenaten was putting forward, um, the people literally had to break down all the beliefs that they had. Yeah. You know? And a lot of people would have trusted the M1 priesthood, as is today. A lot of people... Trust, exactly. trust institutions and establishments that aren't working necessarily in their favour. Yeah. But they'll still fight for them and they trust them. Yeah. Even though somebody else could say, well, are you crazy? Can you not see? Because yeah. they've but, been institutionally brainwashed generation mm, on generation. Well, that's what the, that's what the, the sacred that's what knowledge it's the same thing. allows those who have it to do. Yeah. You can very easily brainwash and control the mind of other people yes. when you know this information. Yeah. But it's only fallen consciousness that would do that because... It's, that's not what it's meant for. And that's what's caused the problem in the first place. Yes. Is that this knowledge has been used to control people. That's exactly. why it's so important to understand this knowledge because it's what it's been used against us. It's the spell that's been cast. Exactly. Like and there's saying, no way the you're going to negate that spell unless you know how it's being cast. Yeah, of course. Unless you know the science that's been used to cast it. Yes. And this is the sacred geometry. Yes is the knowledge because sacred geometry this is what Akhenaten did Akhenaten re-established the mystery schools in ancient Egypt and his symbol for those mystery schools was the right eye of Horus hmm. so what he did was because as I mentioned a lot of the people fought against him and didn't believe him and in actual fact joined the Ammon priesthood to fight Akhenaten yep. and because of that what he said was okay now I'm cutting this kind of short I'm not <laughs> giving in all the details here but what he did was he said Okay, I'm going to move to the exact center, the geodetic center. In other words, if you measured Egypt's landmass from north to south and east to west and got the exact center, yeah. that's where Akhenaten built his new city, directly in the middle of Egypt, yeah. called Akhetaten or Tel Alarmana. Mm, exactly. Okay. So if you think of um, Tel Alarmana being in the direct center of Egypt mm -hmm. and you think of the Great Pyramid being in the direct center of the earth, Mm -hmm. He was following the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. He was trying to re-establish the order. He does exactly what he was doing. He was trying to re-establish the balance. Cosmic order which was thrown out of balance. And there was other reasons for that that has to do with how the M1 priesthood um in ancient Egypt. Now this is a whole other this could actually be a whole other podcast Maybe in and we'll of do itself. That, but we could tip into it for them. So all yeah, the temples in Egypt are aligned to star constellations. Yeah, we should do that. And um Sirius was a very prominent star. Yes. in ancient Egypt and in ancient Egypt they had three calendars they had a Sothic calendar a lunar calendar and a solar calendar that's a calendar based on the Sothic calendar was based on the cycle of Sirius yes. star Sirius the lunar calendar is obviously based on the, on the mm. cycles of the moon and the solar calendar was based on the cycles of the sun yeah. and they ran those three calendars concurrently and so therefore they had 10 day weeks and 3 week months 360 days a year not 365 and a quarter it was 360 days a year. Because that's another thing that's out of balance. The, well, the whole five and how the how five and a half days happened to come into play is told in the ancient Egyptian mythology, mm -hmm. and that's telling how conscious how we're off, how we fell off balance. Oh. Because originally in the ancient Egyptian calendar, there was 360 days in a year. Yeah. A circle is 360 degrees. See. Yeah. If yeah. you're going around the sun in a circle then it's 360 degrees. But you see, we don't go around in sun in a circle now. We go around the sun in an oblique, yeah, um, like an oblong yeah. kind of... Like an egg shape? We actually alternate. We alternate between kind of circular and then kind of egg-shaped yeah, yeah. and yeah. then back to kind of circular and then back to kind of egg-shaped. But at one point, at one point, the earth made a perfect circle around the sun and that was called the Garden of Eden. Yes. <laughs> or the Garden of Atom. <laughs> or the Garden of Akhenaten. Um, so the Garden of Eden was a time when people were fully awake and aware on Earth and they were on an actual planet that was balanced. In other words, the axis of the Earth wasn't tilted at an angle. Yeah. Yeah. It was upright and therefore it made an exact circle around the sun. Yeah. And because of that, there was never any extremes of temperature. 
because the extremes of temperature are caused by um, the earth being either closer in the summer yeah, to the sun seasons, yeah. or further away in the winter. No, yeah, yeah. But if you're going on a circle, then there's no point on that circle where you're going to be closer or further away from the center. Yeah, yeah. it's balanced. That's the whole thing. Why? And another symbol for Akhenaten's mystery school was the circle with the dot in the center. Yeah. yeah. The reason why is because it's on a circle, every point on the circle is equidistant from the center. Yeah. In other words, there's nothing in a circle that's closer or further away to the center. It represents perfect equality, balance, truth and justice. A circle with a dot in it represents perfect balance, equality, truth and justice. And basically you're the dot. You're the dot and you're the circle as well. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. The circumference of the circle is your reality. Yeah. And your perceived um, perceived view of how far you are away from your center. Yeah, exactly. Now, the circle with the dot in the center is also how you first start out to draw your flower of life. But yeah. anyway. So, so you're seeing how the, the geometry is mimic the reality. Right? Yeah. So they are each other. Akhenaten restarted the mystery schools because consciousness was falling and it was been helped along by the corrupt Amon priesthood who mm-hmm. were also fallen consciousness as well. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, so Tutmos III had met with the Atlantean tribes, kicked it off, and then Akhenaten was carrying on that work. But at the same time, um, what happened with Akhenaten was he had rediscovered something that had been found um, after him yeah. and had been found at a time before him by other characters. Um, but he discovered what was known as the Emerald Tablets of Toth. Mm. Akhenaten Ooh. rediscovered what was known as the Emerald Tablets of Toth. hmm now, the story that's told, and this is what you were talking about, what you mentioned yes. to me earlier, the story that's told of Moses going up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a retelling of Akhenaten going up the mountain, which was known as Serabat el Kadim. Yeah, yeah. Serabat el Kadim. Yeah. And that was a mountain that an archaeologist, and I talked about this in the last podcast, known as Flinders Petrie, excavated on top of that mountain and found... Um, well, he didn't have to excavate to find the temple. The temple was there, but he found the temple of Hathor. Yes. And remember I told you that underneath the flagstones they found this white powder. And the white powder that they found was white powder gold. Monatomic one, gold. Monatomic gold, arms, orbitally rearranged monatomic elements. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about monatomic gold and arms is that in the process of taking the gold from being a solid substance and changing it into a white powder. In the process of doing that, and I'm not going to get into it because it's a bit complicated to explain, and I'm not saying that in any other way except for the time element, just to talk about it. Um, But in the process of changing, transmuting, and that's alchemy, transmuting the gold from a solid gold nugget into white powder, in the process of doing that, they created anti-gravity or zero gravity. And they also created portals into other dimensions, and they knew that because the solid substance would lose a certain amount of weight. Where did the weight go? Exactly. It dimension. disappeared. It it's just too hard to, not too hard, but it's another podcast. So, but anyway, um, the story of uh, Moses climbing Mount Sinai is actually the story of Akhenaten um, and the Temple of Hathor where this substance, the Mufkuts, was being created. And remember I told you they were using it at a time when they had lost the ability yeah. to do it, to... to perform the transmutation on themselves yeah. Yeah. and to create their light body. Do you remember in, when we were in Egypt, Charlotte, we found Jeanette, and we were looking at the hieroglyphs and they have like a little mound on their hands? Yeah. That's the Mufkuts. Yeah. yeah. And it can also be shown in kind of a, a cone shape yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. And we even to this day, you know, hot cross buns mm-hmm. because they used to put a cross on the Mufkut cake. <laughs> so our hot cross buns actually is... Um, and is another symbol for that. Uh, I should have said that on the Samhain podcast. I never thought of it. Oh, you can do it now. Oh, well, it's here now. Well, that's <laughs> because that's big here for Samhain. But also, it's also very big for St. Patrick's Day. No. For Easter. Yeah, yeah. Hot cross Easter. Home. Yeah, cross, God, cross. Yeah, exactly. And that's even symbolic about the, the astrological ones, right? things that are happening at that time of years, right? Yeah. It's Aries, the beginning again of the cycle of the Zodiac. So that's thanks for saying that actually because that's what I was t- said I forgot um, I was saying that the the Amun priesthood also broke the cosmic order in such a way that they um, 
the stars, as I mentioned, I was talking about the calendars. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not going to talk too long about that because, again, this is another podcast in and yeah. of itself. But, um, Stick to in, but, it, yeah, but it's important. But, um, in ancient Egypt, what they were doing was they were literally following the stars, hence the followers of Horus or the followers yeah. of the sun, since yes. we already established all suns are stars. Yes. So, um, well, okay. A sun technically is, that has planets orbiting it. A star necessarily mm-hmm. doesn't. So um, the idea was that the priesthood would always follow the movement of the stars in the sky. Yes. And the M1 priesthood broke that order by refusing to move to out move of Luxor. And to follow, and yeah. to follow the stars. Yeah, that's what people don't understand. They were, they were going <coughs> up and down the Nile replicating the solar, or sorry, the cosmic cycle. And then they got so wealthy in Luxor, right, from all of their machinations and breaking mm. the order, that they refused then as priesthoods to begin to leave those temples and move out again and follow. Well, it was done on purpose because yeah. in the, the whole idea of following the stars is, is that they were keeping balance between above and below. Yes, the cosmic so order. So the yeah. Amun priesthood broke that. And as I said, what happens above is reflected below. What happens below is reflected above. And if they can break the cosmic order, then they're going to break the balance of the people on the planet. So course, it's, yeah. it was all about confusing people and putting them off balance and that's yeah. where we're at today well we're all it's off the confusion of the languages right because that symbolizes the fall of consciousness right because before that everybody was telepathic correct? yeah exactly yeah yeah language and is lower energy communication so um Akhenaten established what was mm-hmm. known uh, as, well as i mentioned he established the mystery schools which lasted for approximately 17 to 18 years yeah um during the time in the 18th dynasty and that was based on a number of things, based on his lineage from the original Atlantean tribes, based on what the Atlantean tribes had told his great great grandfather, Tutmos III, mm-hmm. based on his rediscovery of the Emerald Tablets of Toth. Mm-hmm. Um, where, excuse me, just to interrupt you, where did he, did he discover those? Like, I mean, there's a bit of a myth about that or, as well, right? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be a hundred percent sure, but I think it was in the area of Sinai somewhere. Mm-hmm. I think. No, I'm not. I'm not. So again. they were pillars or tablets. Well, we don't pi- know. Pi- yeah. Well, that's the thing. They don't. I mean, to be honest, I my personal view on it is is that the Emerald Tablets of Toth is written everywhere, okay, all over all the temples, okay, um, and is actually left as an open secret, if you like. Yeah. And I think the idea of saying that he rediscovered the tablets was that. It's like if loads of people are looking at one thing and only suddenly one person actually sees what it's really sees saying. Sees a pattern inside that and yeah. goes, hey. That's that's what I, I see. But I think it does say that uh, he found them in the area of um, the Sinai. But there is the... Whole, I know what you're talking about, about yes. the pillars yeah. that were found. And one of them was in um, Luxor. Yeah. And they were two pillars that were found with the science and knowledge of uh, the Atlanteans inscribed. Yes. With That's these why I brought it up, unusual yeah. characters. Yeah, mm-hmm. one of those pillars mm-hmm. um, was in Luxor. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. Um, so it would have been like emerald, you know, like probably carved yeah, into emerald. Yeah, there was emerald. one of, I think there was one made of gold and one made of stone, I think. Something okay. like that. So that is interesting. So different, like even scientifically. It's like telling the same story of the discovery of the emerald tablets in yes. a different way. Yeah. So, um, well, in a lower form, maybe, you know, like one is stone, one is emerald, whatever. I think all the, the the stories of the mystery schools are told in parable form. And it's told in such a way that you can um, adjust the parable for the for person the that you're talking to. Yeah, exactly. Or the consciousness yeah, or the level of consciousness. No, I'm, glad you, it, it'll I'm work, glad you said that. It'll work anyway. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So to wake everyone up, putting no all those where things together, like yeah. the Atlantean knowledge that had come in originally in Septepi. Um, the Atlanteans had Tut- uh, Tutmos III had contacted Tutmos III and what they had told him the rediscovery of the Emerald Tablets and all these things Akhenaten had established what was called the Law of One yes so he re-established the mystery schools in ancient Egypt and he was he was teaching the feminine the feminine way um, and I would can I just mention <coughs> and that is why there's something that drew me to Akhenaten from the time I was a little girl especially in college was the Armana art Oh yeah, which yeah. is is really completely different from any other of the mm. classical Egyptian art, and if we're talking about symbols and we're talking about people leaving messages behind in secret, so that's another way to interpret the Armana art, like in terms of the um, statuary and how he was portrayed as a pharaoh, not in the canon of proportions. It was yeah. different. Yeah. Well, what what Akhenaten said was um, 
that everything should be portrayed as it's seen, you know, because up to the time of Akhenaten, the art was always, all the pharaohs were portrayed as always being in the peak of their health and always being strong, yes. like per, really it was good cool, looking, a, you know, rigid chiseled format, yeah. features yeah. kind of thing. And Akhenaten said, no, you have to, to show things how they are. Mm-hmm. So what he was doing was he was showing the... The Amun priesthood were trying to keep up the facade that mm-hmm. everything was still in balance. Yes. With with the statues and, and um, creating everything with the canon of portions made it look like everything was still in balance when in actual fact it wasn't. Right. And what he was saying was, no, show it as it is. Yeah. Exactly. Show it, show things as out ugly as they are. It's like the portrait of Dorian Gray, if anybody has seen Absolutely. That. The yeah. good Irish story. Um. So... Selling your soul saying, and exactly. you don't age externally, but you do age somewhere externally. No, I'm not saying they were ugly or anything. I mean, no, the I'm Armana art is beautiful. It is gorgeous. I'm just saying he was it's saying, more realistic. don't show me as a chiseled, perfectly good looking yeah. th- but thing it is that I'm not. This well. is what I look like. Show me yeah, as the way it I is look. Stylized it's stylized. Well, it's, it's stylized. But I well, would say, for me as an artist... Yeah, but I, some people would say, is it stylized? Because, I mean, that's the whole idea of the head of Akhenaten and um, Nefertiti and the mm-hmm. children. Is it stylized art or is it actually how they looked? Well, that's that's the, that's the whole but thing. But you see, the very thing is, I think it is actually how they looked because okay. um, the schools mm-hmm. of people at that time, not necessarily Akhenaten himself, or I'm not saying, but of people at the same time in Armana has been found and they have got those Oh, yeah, heads. yeah, yeah, the, the cone. And the head of Tutankhamun head. himself. Oh, yeah, cone, I've seen it. It's a cone, cone head. head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have you seen his head? It's a, yeah, yeah, it kind of yeah. goes up this way. Yeah. And, and if then, you look, and the, then it kind of comes back. It's like the back of the cranium. You know, the back of it is like mm. extended. And if you look at the head of his the daughters, skulls in South America, the Paracelsus skulls have the same thing. Yeah. And uh, Nefertiti had the same mm-hmm. head. And if you look at the head of Akhenaten and Nefertiti's daughters, yes, one of which is buried in Ireland. If That's you remember, right. her name is Glenn Scota. Um, their heads are the same. If you look at the, the heads of Mariatan or Scota, the Mariatan and Scota, same person. Um, their head, you'll see her, she has a really big skull, yeah. even bigger than Tutankhamun. Um, now, what that's about, I mean, there's different speculations about yes. why, so I'm not going to get into that, but anyway. No. Um, <laughs> so, just an interesting thing is, you know, where the people climb Mount, where it says in the Bible, they climb Mount Sinai, and when Moses came down the mountain and the people were had made a golden calf? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, the whole golden calf... Uh, in the Bible, it says that Moses made the people melt the calf and eat the gold. And that sound in the Bible, that sounds weird. People never understood what that meant. But in actual fact, we're talking about the Mufkuts. Yeah, the monotonic And if gold. you think of Moses climbing um, Sarah Bad al-Kadim mm-hmm. and what they were actually doing on the top in the, in the Temple of Hathor, they were making this white powder gold and the people were eating it. So if you think of it in that way, Moses, a.k.a. Akhenaten, coming down the mountain and telling the people, melt the gold and eat the calf doesn't sound... Or no. melt the gold and eat it doesn't sound that strange. It sounds like it's a process. So anyway, what was received on in the Bible, it says that Moses received the Ten Commandments um, from the burning bush on Mount Sinai. Well, I'm saying it was Akhenaten on Sarabat el-Kadim. And um, the Ten Commandments come from what's known as the 42 negative confessions. Exactly. From the Book of Coming Forth by Light, a.k.a. the Book of the Dead. Mm-hmm. And the 42 negative confessions are recited when your heart has been weighed against the balance of the feather in the Hall of Matt. That's it. And if you remember, Matt was Toth's wife or daughter. Yes. His female counterpart. Good, yeah. So what Akhenaten was doing was returning the ancient knowledge what he was doing was as i said he established the right eye and they were the feminine mystery schools Mm. and most of the initiates that he actually took through into immortality were females Mm. they were women that's interesting yeah so we can see why the priesthood would not be happy about that. Well, that, that's it was all, that's why he did it because yeah. it was to balance. Do you remember the, mm. the thing had been gone from a matriarchal society? Yes, to a patriarchal. Pharaoh now, a matriarchal society does not mean women are ruling. No, a matriarchal society means everything is equal and balanced between right. men and women. Yes, but a patriarchal society does not mean that it's everything hierarchical. is balanced. It means that men rule. Yeah. So we went from a balanced. To, again, it's all about the, the balance, um, and so. Um, it's an interesting thing that when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, there was part of the Dead Sea Scrolls and one of them was the Copper Scroll. Yes, and that's very fascinating. Now again, that's another, I'm only mentioning it because it's another podcast. Another in podcast yes, in itself because it's so... Yeah, right. it's so <laughs> but um, 
So embedded in um, the Copper Scroll is the name of Akhenaten. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's a code that's left it's, in it. It's embedded like one letter at a time in a different language to the rest of it. But when you actually put it together, you yeah. see that it's the name of Akhenaten. Yeah. And what the Copper Scroll does is it describes 64 treasures that are buried in secret locations all over Egypt. Mm-hmm. Now, the interesting thing about the 64 treasures is that um, in our DNA, we have... 64 different um, ways of um, codons being created. Yeah. Or I'll just say we have 64 codons yes. in our DNA. They're not all operative, but there's, there's 64. Um, in the non-existent junk DNA? Yeah. The 12 so, strands of crystaller DNA? <laughs> so they consist of four different bases and they're grouped in um, three. So it's like four by four by four, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, which makes 64 codons. And so the idea uh, of the 64 treasures is actually referring to DNA and alchemy and how to um, create the light body. Because don't forget, that's what was lost. That's what the knowledge was lost because your light body is you. Yes. Not in 3D form, if you like. Out of your body. So in the beginning of Akhenaten's name, his name is Anak. And I spoke about this before. Yeah. And Anak is Anak effective spirit. And that's somebody who... Because ultimately what they were doing was building a menti on the ground yes. with the temples. The yes. Garden of Eden, a time when we were all balanced and fully awakened. That's what they were building on the ground with yeah. all the temples. Um, for us to, to be able to, to get back to that point, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, an act effective spirit is somebody who has achieved that and built something in the 3D. But it's also somebody who has after death, and this is what's in the Book of Coming Forth by Light, united the Ka and the Ba yeah. to become a Nak effective spirit. Yes. So that's another term for the unification of the two lands, the uniting yeah. of the Ka and the Ba. And what that does, it creates the higher self or the person of light. The light body. The light body. So, um, Akhenaten then we see at a time when the corruption of the Amun priesthood came to such a point that... Um, Literally, the power went out in Egypt. Yeah. They lost the high degree of knowledge they had. Yeah. And everything started to become degraded. Their buildings, they couldn't Maintain achieve them the same. Anything. Well, you can see it clearly in some places. There's a mud brick <laughs> the layer. The artwork goes down. The construction, they couldn't build perfect pyramids. They yeah. couldn't. The artwork, they everything degenerates. Yeah. And that was when the exodus of the final few people, um, Akhenaten and his... Fa- his tribe, his, his, his family followers, left. Followers, his family left and um, when they left Egypt uh, literally the lights went out in Egypt mm. and civilization in Egypt fell to where it is today yeah so it, ne- it has never recovered it's never recovered no so um, I've been on the Giza plateau it is the, it's Kaputsk yeah so if you follow the lineage of and again in the Bible that story is told as the exodus from yes. Egypt now just a quick point because they call the people Israelites the whole idea in ancient Egypt of the word Israelite, it wasn't referring to people from Israel. An Israelite just meant a foreigner. Yeah. Um, the word Israelite did not mean what it means today. Yeah. So um, these people migrated out of Egypt and where did they go? Well, their story is told then in the form, and you can pick up the story in the form of Akhenaten's daughter, um, Mary Aten, who became known as Skota, mm-hmm. and her husband, who is known as Gaithalos or Gadel Glass. Mm-hmm. And their story and their entourage is told of leaving Egypt, coming through Spain into England and then Scotland and Scotland being named after Scotland and then eventually into Ireland. And they bring with them um, the Stone of Destiny. Right. The Lea Fall. Ireland is known as the Inish Fall, the yes. Island of Destiny. Now the Stone of Destiny, the stone is the stone that Jacob laid his head on and had the dream of the angels coming up and down the ladder. Oh my. And <laughs> when he, when Jacob came back down the ladder after meeting with God, God said to him, you, you're, you will be no longer known as Jacob. You will now be known as Israel. So that whole story is talking about somebody who died and was reborn. Yeah. Um, it's not about a nation of Israelites or people or anything. It's a mystery school body of knowledge Im- embedded in a parable. And that parable is of Jacob being died and being reborn and being renamed. The idea that he's renamed is showing you that he was reborn. Yeah. So that was the knowledge that these people... But he was born with a memory of who he was before. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That um, was the optimum 
Oh, that's the total goal. Job. That's the total yes. goal. Being dying Just and reborn, we do that whatever. all the time. Yeah, everyone does. It's called reincarnation. We're reincarnated all the time. Yeah. Sorry, that's a good point, Christine. Yeah. Dying and reborn consciously. So that was the knowledge that um, Akhenaten and his lineage then brought back out of Egypt and into Ireland in the form of Skota. Now, there's many other connections, but I think I'm I'm I being told by to, Charlotte I'm that we need to... Uh, we need to finish. So, um, yeah, there's obviously there's loads more. But anyway, yes. on, we'll on that note, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on another on, on that note, on that note, we're going to say good night. And I'm going to say good night to Charlotte, who's hanging off the side of the chair here. <laughs> Exposing me. Good, good night, night, Charlotte. Good night. And good night to Christine. And I would say so just to let you know that the, the don't believe everything you're told. And there's more to learn about all the subjects, anything to do with you. You see, I sure. could have kept talking for hours, but you me see, too. there's yeah. so much in it, you know. So anyway, sure. thank well, you for listening yeah. and talk again soon. Yeah. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Slon. Slon.